So I'm going to present quite similar work, but for a different continent. We are now traveling to Sub-Sahara Africa. And I'm presenting joint work with Eva Tasseva at the London School of Economics and my colleague at Sasbury, Gemma Wright. So what's the starting point of our paper? Oh, sorry. Well, if a shock happens to household income, there are many ways how households can cope with this, right? And especially in the absence of social protections. So individuals can either self-insure, they can borrow from their friends, from their neighbors, they can use up the savings, they can rely on support from family members, or they can insure privately on the market. However, not everyone can save or borrow, and the ability to rely on others may be quite constrained at times of crisis. So at times like COVID, for example, where many people suddenly find themselves unemployed or with earning shock, the uh, ability to borrow from your friend or your neighbor is quite reduced. And on top of that, private insurance against a job loss usually does not exist uh, in many um, yeah, in general. So in these cases, government policy response via social protection benefits is key for redistributing resources and providing social assistance and insurance. So this, how is the situation of social protection in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, we actually know from the literature that a large share of benefits do go to the poor, but um, we know that there is limited benefit coverage of the poor and limited effectiveness. Uh, so even if people are covered, the, the amount they receive is often not sufficient, uh, sufficient to move them above the poverty line. We also know that uh, poverty has actually increased in sub-Saharan Africa following the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the surging in prices are uh, due to the, the Russian war in the Ukraine, while at the same time government spending often has not increased in the region. And there is very little evidence on how responsive social protection systems are to the negative shock uh, in lower and uh, in low and lower middle income countries. So we think it's important to understand how uh, social protection systems react to such shocks in order to improve the design of benefits. <clears throat> and that's where we're coming from with this paper. Um, we examine the performance of social protection systems in five African countries. We are focusing on two lower uh, middle income countries, Ghana and Tanzania, and on three low income countries, which are Mozambique, Uganda, and Zambia. And we study the population coverage of social protection benefits and their impact on consumption poverty in normal times and times of crisis. So even though this session uh, is called something uh, about COVID, we are actually not focusing on COVID as such, but we are simulating an artificial shock uh, to all these countries. We are focusing on two scenarios. One is what we call normal times. So that's a pre-pandemic 2019 situation. And then we induce a crisis situation where we simulate a hypothetical reduction to household earnings or employment. And similar to David, we use a micro simulation tax benefit models. Uh, we are using models for Sub-Saharan Africa, and all of them have been developed uh, in the South Mode project, which is uh, quite an important project of UNU wider. We use nationally representative household service to calculate benefit entitlements, tax liabilities, and household net income in normal times, and how it changes during our crisis situation. And we study the effects of benefits on household consumption. So we are trying to answer two questions. First of all, we assess the extent to which social protection benefits provide support to household in normal times, which is quite important because the better um, households can cope in normal time, the better they are prepared uh, with a shock, uh, with an income shock. And secondly, we examine how effective benefits are in protecting income and consumption during crisis, which is called uh, the automatic uh, stabilization uh, characteristic of existing social protection system. 
Because the more responsive policies are to changes in people's circumstances, the more insurance and income consumption smoothing they provide when a shock happens. So why are automatic stabilizers important? We have already seen uh, that they played quite little role in protecting poorer households uh, during COVID-19 in Latin America. Um, so we, we want to know how, how well they provide uh, support in sub-Saharan Africa. And automatic stabilizers are the inbuilt flexibility of existing benefits to respond automatically to a change in the household's income situation. We know from the literature that uh, uh, better automatic stabilizers decrease the variation in household incomes and consumption and provide social insurance against risk. And they also decrease poverty volatility over the business cycle and redistribute resources. However, a lot of this literature is actually focused on high income countries. So what we want to add to the literature here is the, the focus on sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, to continue why are automatic stabilizers important? Well, there are many advantages of automatic stabilizers over discretionary government responses because if you already have benefits in place that take uh, changes to the household's income situation into account, there is no extra government needed when a crisis actually happens. So there is no time delay between government decision and new policy. And Having good automatic stabilizers in place also ensures that support is provided as long as needed and targeted to those in need. And policy provision is already there via existing administrative uh, and infrastructure. So uh, you don't need to create new policies and new administrative channels uh, when a crisis or a shock happens which also means that policymakers are freed up to focus on the idiosyncratic and anticipated aspects of a crisis, so the additional um, risks when a crisis happens. Um, however, there are also constraints to automatic stabilizers, so by design policies may not uh, respond automatically to fluctuations in household incomes or only respond with a delay and we see this in many sub-Saharan African countries because the design of the policies is not that they have an, uh, um, a direct income um, uh, means test but they use proxy means tests. So they use information uh, in the household that is more stable and also information from the past to, def to kind of uh, Proxy means test whether a household is eligible for a benefit or not. Um, uh, there is also limited effectiveness due to limitations of existing policies, like, for example, gaps in coverage or low value of benefit payments. So if the benefits are not adequate to um, improve the household's income situation in normal times, they are most likely also not adequate to uh, provide support when a shock happens. And of course, there is a very important constraint in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the limited fiscal space to expand spending in crisis. So, for example, the inability to borrow, uh, which limits the impact of policies. However, what we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic is that many countries did have some room for implementing emergency response uh, to the income drops. So these are the benefits that we are focusing on. You can see that there are non-means-tested benefits in Ghana and Zambia. Um, there is an old age benefit that is quite important in Uganda, and it's also the only national um, policy uh, that is included in Uganda. Uh, there are also some farmers, agricultural related benefits in Zambia. And then there, there are some means-tested benefits, like social assistance-related benefits in Ghana, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Zambia, and social insurance pension in Ghana, Mozambique, and Zambia. So these are the benefits that are included in the Southmood models, and these are also the most important programs that provide cash support or quasi-cash support to households in, the five, in these five sub-Saharan countries. 
So uh, what are the characteristics of these benefits? Well, we, we know that there is an eligibility test for means-tested benefits, which includes an income test in Mozambique and Tanzania. However, most of the uh, support that is provided actually pro, um, relies on proxy means tests, such as food insecurity, vulnerability, um, uh, also, there are categorical definitions like households with children, female-headed households, or households with a disabled member or chronically ill member. Unemployment insurance programs often don't exist, or they are just in, uh, in development right now, and they often only protect a very small share of the population. And there is overall little spending on social protection as percentage of GDP. So for example, it's 1.7% in Tanzania compared to 3.8% on average in Africa or 12.9% in the world globally. So as I said, we're using South Mode models and household uh, budget surveys for our analysis. And we simulate two types of shocks. One is an earning shock, where we reduce 10% of individuals' earnings. And the other one is an employment shock, where we randomly move people out of employment uh, and until we reach an aggregate earnings fall by 10%. Why are we not using the COVID shock? Well, we want to use the stress testing methodology developed by Atkinson, and we want to keep as many factors constant across the countries as possible. So we want to uh, introduce the same shock to all the countries to see how they react to, to, to this drop in incomes. So let's turn to the results in normal times. This is the benefit coverage uh, of individuals living in households, in, which is uh, at 54% in Ghana and also quite high in Zambia and quite low in all the other countries. If you look at whether the coverage is due to non-means-tested benefits or means-tested benefits or social insurance uh, public pension, you see that a lot of these benefits in Ghana are actually coming through non-means-tested uh, programs, while in Zambia, 40% receive non-means-tested programs and 23% means-tested benefits. Um, yeah, the situation is quite different in the other three countries. Now here we show the benefit coverage by income quintiles or consumption quintiles, and we see there is some progressivity in the coverage in Ghana, Zambia, um, uh, and to some extent in Tanzania. We usually see that uh, it's more progressive when we focus on consumption groups rather than income groups, which shows that most of these countries actually focus on consumption poor households. Now, if we look at poverty, what we show here is the, the total poverty rate uh, based on consumption and the extreme poverty line uh, as defined by the World Bank. And we also see how the, the poverty line, uh, the poverty situation would look like if there weren't any benefits in the countries. To better understand whether um, programs that are currently in place um, reduce the situation. And we only see small effects in Ghana and Zambia and very negligible uh, effects in the other three countries. Okay, so I'm skipping the, <laughs> the, the summary for normal times and I'm now moving to the crisis situation. So now we have again the benefit coverage in normal times with, uh, which I've just presented to you and then the, how the coverage changes once we introduce an employment shock and an earning shock. And what we see is that actually benefit coverage does not change. So this means that there are hardly any automatic stabilizers in terms of benefit coverage built into the current social protection systems in sub-Saharan African countries. If we look uh, uh, at the same impact, but now again for consumption poverty rate, uh, again, the first three columns is what I've just showed you, and then the last three columns is whether um, the, the situation changes um, once we, we introduce the shock. And if you just look at the final column, you see that actually there are hardly any poverty cushioning effects across all the countries. So even in countries where there are uh, more advanced uh, social protection systems like in Ghana or Zambia, 
they are not able to cushion income or consumption shocks uh, during times of crisis. Uh, this shows the, how mean net incomes changes across the income distribution. And again, we see that there are drops across the distribution. And what we were interested to see here is actually the, the blue bar, whether means test the benefits now chip in and cushion the income shock. And you can see that there are hardly any effects or no effects at all. You, you can't see any in any of the countries, these bright blue bars popping up. So in conclusion, uh, we assess the effectiveness of benefit systems to respond to negative shocks in five low and lower middle income countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the benefit system in all countries is ineffective in stabilizing income and consumption during crisis. Even though benefit coverage is higher in Ghana and Zambia, um, there is almost no cushioning effects uh, for, for the poverty situation and there, are, uh, there is almost no benefit coverage in the other three countries. Uh, the simulated shocks to earnings and employment of course lead to a reduction in net income and consumption and to an increase in poverty and the benefits are not responsive to changes in person's earnings or employment because they are universal within a certain group and they are linked to proxies of income and not income itself. So they are not, they are not uh, designed to be automatic stabilizers across the five countries. In any case, designing strong benefit stabilizers is important to prepare for future crises. And that's uh, one of the main takeaways of our paper. Thank you very much. <laughs>